Welcome to another episode of One on One with Mr. Fawn. Joining me this week, the metal god, the one, the only, Rob Halford of Judas Priest. We talk post-Redeemer of Souls, Richie Faulkner, K.K. Downing, and will the band be touring with Kiss on a co-headline tour in 2016 or beyond? On the other side of that, I have got Robert Fleischman, singer for Vinnie Vincent's Invasion, Journey, and of course his own solo material. Plenty to get to today, so let's stop talking and get right into Rob Halford, the metal god. Hi, Mitch. Hello, Rob. How are you? I'm doing very well, my friend. How are you doing today? I'm doing exceptionally well. and um, That's good. Uh, you know, it's a pleasure talking to you once again. Um, you, know, you know, let me start there, actually. Uh, I've had a chance to speak with you six or seven times, if not more, over the years for, for all kinds of various projects. And you've always been exceptionally, exceptionally nice. Um, was there ever a time in your history where you were just sort of this out of control egomaniac, or have you always just been this nice? <laughs> well, <clears throat> I would say uh, you catch me when I'm not having my diva moments. <laughs> I, I can be, I, I can be quite uh, challenging when things aren't going the way. I think they should go, um, and that's because all of us in priests are absolute perfectionists, you know. We're quite the taskmaster uh, with everybody that is involved with priests to make sure that we get the things uh, done and dusted, as we say in the UK, right. uh, with the minimum of, um, of problems. And having said that, no, I, I, you know, I... Um, I, I suppose again, being a musician, I, I wear my emotions on my sleeve. So if I do, if I do blow up, that's just my emotions working. I right. think it's healthy to. I think anger is a very healthy thing if it's um, if it's if it's kind of sent out under the right circumstances, um, and uh, and frustration and what have you. But now I'm I'm blessed. I. Uh, I, uh, I I do all my venting on stage. I think we all do in priests. <laughs> it's quite it's quite the opposite when people when people meet us. Um, right. You know, our fans meet us or, or anybody uh, outside of the, the musical performance. There's always this. I can't believe it's the same person I'm speaking to. Right. But that's the power of heavy metal, Mitch. Yeah, it really is. And, and one of the reasons I ask is I, I know recently you've spoken uh, to the Canadian media about being 30 years sober. And so I was wondering, before sobriety hit, was there this moment of, oh my God, this guy's completely out of control. He, he's, he's not approachable. And, and was that maybe something that spurned you on to say, hey, I, we got to change. This, this is too much. Or was it just too much drugs and too well, much again, right. again, um you know, when I was going through that um, that turmoil, because it did come become quite um, tumultuous <laughs> towards the end before I before I made the necessary steps to uh, to make an improvement there. Um, uh, you know, there are all different kinds of personalities that come out when you when you drink and do whatever mm -hmm. else. Mine, for the most part, was the um, the fun guy. I, I rarely, I rarely was the the um, the aggressive guy. Although again, I, I'll freely admit that the um, the obstacles that that were created by my addiction did turn me into something of a Jekyll and Hyde character. Right. And it was getting quite extreme towards the the final weeks of my um, eventually becoming sober. And uh, so even now, I, I look I look back at those moments with um, you know the blessings of my higher power, and I, I'm really grateful that I was able to um, make those necessary Adjust. steps to to change and, and to put all that behind me. Uh, let's get to the present. Redeemer of Souls came out in 2014. The band's been on the road supporting it for for the last year. Uh, new music in terms of a new album, is that something that you're looking forward to or is it at, at this point even necessary? I mean, you certainly could put your name on a marquee and play, you know, uh, stuff from British Steel and, and Screaming for Vengeance and get a crowd to show up. Is it necessary at this point even to make a new album? 
That's a good question, Mitch. Yeah. Um, of course, a preset, as we'll be bringing up to you guys when we swing through um, Halifax and um, and Toronto one more time, um, is a combination of music that we put together at the very beginning of the band, you know, songs from Sad Wings of Destiny, for example, all, all the way through to Redeemer of Souls. And I think one of the great loves of my involvement in Priest is that there is still that curiosity, that kind of sense of what can we do next. And we uh, we genuinely do become excited with the prospect of sitting down and and seeing what we can come up with. That's that I really feel again is the essence of a of a solid musician. And so the writing um experiences that we just had, especially with Richie uh in the team for the first time, Glenn and Richie and myself sitting down and writing this this trio was extraordinary. And um and there was so much going on, Mitch, that we, we, we actually had to kind of put the brakes on because our label um was waiting, you know, with the calendar prepared to have delivery, go into post production, make the CDs, blah blah blah. Um so yes, and and on a on a final note to that, we uh, we were so so um, enthusiastic that we were we're now um, ready to go and, and do that again. So at some point next year, we'll be back in the writing mode. Yeah, I look forward to it. And Richie's been a great addition to, to the band. I think I, the look and the sound is, is just perfect for Priest. Uh, but if I may, K.K. Downing, though, uh, is he a brother to you at this point or, or a person non grata? We're very, very close in the band, okay. all of us. It, you know, it, it, it is very much like a family. You know, it's not it's not exactly a bloodline, but it it does feel like that. I mean, we, you know, particularly um, with Glenn and and uh, and Ian, uh, and of course Scott came along with with Painkiller and, and Richie recently. But you you, you hear bands um, talking about brothers in, in, in the band, and 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 that's what it is. You know, you you become very tight um, emotionally through the music as well as. As well as, as well as in other areas, but again, um, there's a tremendous respect for each other's um, private lives. We're there for each other outside of the music, but for the most part, and again, <clears throat> this might sound odd to people listening to us talk, Mitch. Right. When we finish work, and I say work, I mean touring, especially. Right. We'll say our goodbyes to each other, and we we may have minimum communication for weeks and months at a time. And that's just the way it is when you're in a band, you know, and you're, you're living with each other 24 hours a day for weeks, months, maybe years at a time when, you, right. when you're touring. But most definitely, yeah, Richie is um, is a brother. Richie's uh, immersed, embedded in the band, and he's, uh, it's a great place for him to be at right now and for all of us. Right, and, and I was also uh, inquiring about KK at this point. Is, is he somebody that you, that, you would, that you still consider a friend, or because of what happened and him leaving the band, you go, eh, well, we're done? Well, I'd like to consider that the friendship is still there. Yes, we've had no communication with KK since he um, retired. Um, you know, there are, there are bits and pieces that come to the surface through various portions of the media. And um, again, it's not unusual. I mean, he's he's enjoying his life. He's he's having a great time, from what I know, and I'm happy for him. Uh, and we've always said uh, in, in this band, we're always checking on each other's welfare. How are you doing? How are you feeling? Are you having a good day? What's going on? You know, anything you want to talk about? And um, so on that on that level, um, we wish we wish Kai Kai uh, all the best. You know, and right. uh, and again, that's just. Um, this is the way it is with the band. You know, when I was away from Priest for 10 years, I think it was, Mitch, I had absolutely no communication with, with anyone in Priest or Priest management. And yet when we reunited, it was as though we just kind of said goodbye last week. That's just the extraordinary bond that's created when you're in music. 
and it's and you know what it's like, Mitch. You've spoken to musicians for many many years, and you know how how groups work. It's 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 a, it's a, it can still be an extraordinary extraordinarily fragile thing to be in a group. Oh, absolutely. Because it's the chemistry, as as again you and I talked many times in the past, Mitch. Mm-hmm. It's the chemistry of a band that's made up of very individual, separate-minded people, but that collected chemistry makes something very, very special happen in the form of the music that you write and record and perform live. You know, you you just mentioned the time that you were away for 10 years. Was it sort of an eye-opener that nobody called and said, hey, Rob, how's it going? Were you somewhat disappointed or actually relieved like oh i'm getting a break from all of this or was it like hey wait a minute how wh- why isn't he yeah yeah there, there were there were times when i felt that you know I, I wish we were having some kind of communication but I, but I, it, it, having been in in the, in the band for so long and, and knowing everyone like we do with each other it wasn't that peculiar and i think if you if you'd have asked any of my mates who were in the same circumstance, you know, you know who I'm talking about, when they were away doing their uh, their solo adventures, um, I, I'm pretty sure that they went through the same type of thing as well. It's like you have to kind of get something out of your system. It's it's uh, it's quite difficult to talk about because it is such a an ingrained emotional thing that you're going through, but. Uh, but now, you know, yeah, there were days when I wish I mean, I wish I could speak to Glenn, I wish I could speak to, you know, management. And and, um, and uh, part of it is just a very peculiar human foible that we've got about. I don't want to pick the phone up and make a call and, and be rejected or pushed back. You know, it's that hindsight thing and that, yep. that thing that we always, we, human beings always tend to, to think about um, not the worst possible outcome, but you kind of, filter that in your brain before you make a move. And, uh, and I, on a, on a daily basis, I'm always trying to better myself in that way, you know, through my through my sober um, tools and, and thinking that I have around me. Um, it's, a, it's a funny life, isn't it, which the way people are, including myself. Yeah, it really is. Um, I see that we've only got about five minutes left, so, so, so let me get away from that for a second and, and ask you about the album Turbo from from the mid '80s. The band had had sort of joined the, the the Sunset Strip look and stuff, and and it has a song on there called Parental Guidance, which is my guilty priest pleasure. I love that song more than anything. Um, looking back at that album, are you proud of it? Was was it a good moment for the band? Um, other than Turbo, w- would you like to start playing some of those songs again? Love it. In fact, we've. Up until recently, we've had Turbo, the, the actual title track, in the set list. We've just changed up the set list for this particular leg of the tour. You probably heard that we're doing Screaming for Vengeance for the first time in over 30 years. Yeah. And that's just blowing the roof off. It's absolutely remarkable. But I love that album. I think the Turbo, much like every Priest album, has its own legs to stand on. And, and again, if you look at the broad um, scope of music that Priest has created for nearly 40 years. We've always been a very, very diverse metal band. That, 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 that's been part of our, that's been part of our makeup. We're the band that can, you know, um, break the law, live after midnight, be the painkiller, be the sin of the sentinel, the redeemer of souls, the ripper. I could go on and on and on. And that's, that's been one of the joys of Judas Priest. There, re- there really is no other band in the world that I'm aware of that has the same kind of repertoire as Judas Priest, and that, that, that makes us really, really proud that we've got that kind of individuality that we enjoy so much success with, with our fans. Yeah, absolutely. Now, now as, as time's running out, we're almost to the yes-no answers here. Uh, okay. So, solo-wise, uh, is there something more you would like to say? You, because I loved your solo albums. I, I thought they were great. Uh, Thank you. More coming, or Priest is, is, is it for now? Priest leads me. Okay. Uh, and, and if time permits, um, uh, I would I would still like I'm still curious to see what else can be done. Okay, um, I've I've heard many rumors about a Judas Priest Kiss co-headlining tour next summer. True or false? Oh really? Okay. Well, 
I, I've um, heard that. I, I, I wouldn't. Hey, hey, I wouldn't say no to that. But um, it's funny you should. You should did you, you did kiss? Kiss you talking about? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Gene Simmons, Paul Stanley. Yeah, I, I, I thought I, it would I, be a great co-bill. Yeah, I was at dinner with some friends here last night in San Francisco, and um, they mentioned that, and I'm like, where is this all floating around from, you know? I don't know, but um, I will acknowledge this, and I've always acknowledged that, um, that one of the great tours that we had in the early years of Priest coming to America was um, opening up for Kiss. It was their last tour that they did before they took the makeup off, and... Uh, we were recently out with Kiss doing some European festivals together, and Gene and Paul will, will quite openly admit that, you know, hey, we were listening to you, but we were putting the makeup on. Priest has always been our favourite metal band, and so if that were to happen, I think it would be a lot of fun. Uh, you, absolutely, and, and I see we're, we're out of time. I, I still need to, at some point, have a one-hour or two-hour sit-down with you to go over all these questions, but uh, again, always, always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mitch. All the best, my friend. Look Absolutely. after yourself, and thank you for uh, looking after Priest and keeping the metal faith. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And there you have it, folks, my interview with Rob Halford of Judas Priest. He is by far one of the nicest people you will ever speak to in your life. Forget rock stars and sports guys. or Guys, he's just one of the nicest guys you will ever talk to. Now, if you're talking rock stars, Listen, Alice Cooper and David Coverdale are right in there with him as being exceptionally, exceptionally kind, generous, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And speaking of that, uh, somebody who was very, very generous with their time in our interview is Robert Fleischman, who, of course, spent some time with the Vinnie Vincent invasion and um, Journey. So if you're a fan of Journey or Vinnie Vincent, you will indeed enjoy what Robert has to say. And again, since I'm doing this uh, solo, no co-host, which, you know, is something I seem to be getting into these last few days. Um, enjoy Robert Fleischman. Here he is. Good morning, Mitch. Good How are we doing today? Good, good. Sur surviving, as, as we say. Um, yeah. You know, I, I've looked over your, your, your history, and I've been familiar with it, having been a Journey fan, a Kiss fan, etc., a lot of exciting stuff, but but before we get into the past stories, let's talk about the present. Um, you've got a new band called The Sky and an album called Stratosphere. How is that? Uh... Yes, Stratosphere is. Um, I'm writing Stratosphere as we speak. Right. Is it? Is it? Which will be the third Sky album? Yes. Still scheduled for 2015, or or are we looking at 2016 for it? Well, it looks more like sixteen because, okay, yeah, you know, I, I just I just want to make sure this Nick the third album is, um, you know, a stellar one. Okay, so 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 talk to me a little bit about the band. Uh, so when did it come together, and uh, you know, what what are the plans for it? Well, how it came together was. Um, I uh, received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame with uh, Journey. Mm -hmm. And uh, after the ceremonies, they played at the House of Blues on Sunset in Hollywood. And I went to the show, and when they were setting up, um, Neil and the guys asked me if I'd be interested in coming up and singing Wheel in the Sky with them. And I I said, sure, sure. And I, I it was... I don't even know why I said even that, but I, I did. <laughs> and I'm glad that I did. And I got up on stage and I just realized how much I missed being on stage and having, you know, that sound behind you and being able to sing through that microphone and hear, you know, just hear the big roar of it all and see all the people. And it just kind of made me feel like I really want to do this again. So um, a friend of mine, Andre LaBelle, who um, did uh, play drums on some of the stuff for Vinny that, that later on became bootlegged, um, uh, called me up and co congratulated me. And I said, you know, I'm thinking about putting a band together. And he said uh, that he knew a lot of people in Richmond, Virginia, and that I should come down and check it out. And I, I entertained the thought and I did go down there and I spent a week down there. And I really loved everybody that was um, involved, um, you know, with me down there. And I just decided to go back 
And uh, I sort of planted roots there and um, developed the band. I, I Within a year's time, I, well, under a year's time, I wrote like 12 or 13 songs and rehearsed the band, got all the right band members together, got a place to rehearse, you know, got a place to record, you know, did the whole process. So that's how it kind of happened. And, um, and then soon after that, we, we did a couple of gigs and then I decided I wanted to go right back in and, and record some, another album, which is, um, majestic that's out right now right. that you can get on, um, the sky com. The first CD was sold out on the, um, on the website. So the only way to get the first CD, the sky, um, which is on, um, iTunes. Which is a, so I'm working on stratosphere right now. <laughs> um, what are the challenges of putting together a new band? I mean, uh, or let me rephrase that. <laughs> what is the goal for the band? Is this just something that you want to have there and and do a few weekend warrior gigs, or are you looking to establish this as a more commercial, radio friendly band? And you know, let's go, let's compete in this marketplace. Well, it's more. It's always. Yeah, the uh, the the nucleus of the idea is to make it into a real band, and and that's what I've been trying to do. But you know, it's so hard to do um, this in the climate of the music industry now. It's just you know, it's 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 like you're swimming with uh, cement sneakers. You know, it's it's a hard thing to do. Yeah, it it really is. So. Um, let's, let's start going back in time here. Uh, journey. Were you surprised first of all, that they invited you to the, to the, uh, uh, induction ceremony? Um, yes, yes. And, uh, yes and no. Yeah. Yeah. It was, <laughs> so, so, so tell me about that time. Uh, you know, you did wheel in the sky and, uh, winds of March and so on and so forth. How did you get into the band? Um, I was playing in a, a cover band in Chicago. And this is like 1977, I think, or 76. And um, I uh, was playing this cover band, and I got a call. Um, well, I got I, well. This is what happened. <laughs> I was I was I was in uh, California in Redonda Beach, and I was leaving my. Um, uh, my apartment and um i had the key to the uh apartment in my pocket when i was just about to leave and get out and, and, and leave and i forgot to give it to the landlady so i i yeah, I, rem- I reached in my pocket and to get my keys to my car and there was the key for the apartment so i got out of my car and then there was like a a card on the on the on the street and it was a playing card and it was the, the Queen of Diamonds. And <clears throat> I looked at it and I picked it up because I knew this girl that I used to find cards all the time and she would read them like um, like a fortune. And she'd go, oh, you know, you're going to have good luck this week or whatever. And I'd you know, call her and go, hey, I just found an uh, ace of clubs or whatever. And she'd tell me my fortune kind of. <sighs> so I saw the card, I picked it up, put it in my pocket, went up to, um, to the landlady's um, door, knocked on it, and then I heard a ring upstairs, which was my, my apartment, and my phone was ringing. So I ran upstairs, I go up, and I open up the door, I grab the phone, and it was this booking agent from Chicago. And <clears throat> he was friends with some people that I knew in Los Angeles, a guy named Bruce Glattman, who was involved with the doors and stuff at that time. And so um, he asked me if I'd be interested in coming to Chicago. And uh, he had a couple of bands that um, that was uh, in his stable at his uh, booking agents at his booking agency, and um, I said uh, sure. So he goes, great. Um, I'll uh, I'll book you a, uh, a flight on Continental Airlines, and uh, we'll see you next week. And I said great. And so I looked at my card that I had and that I picked up and it was the, you know, Queen of Diamonds, but on the other side it said Continental Airlines. <laughs> Which was kind of strange because it was a, uh, you know, those playing cards that they give you on the airlines. Right, right, right. Play uh poker or whatever you want to play. Well, it was a Continental Airline and um that was really strange. So I went there, I found a band that I really dug 
and um, and I just played with him, and I'm really glad that I did that. And then about seven months later, I got a call from um, Barry Fay, who was a very um, well-known uh, promoter. Him and Bill Graham pretty much cut the United States up like a pie, and and they um, they they did all the shows there. They promoted all the shows. Uh, Barry did the Stones, the Zeppelin. Um, you know, he he brought you two into um, into the states and did the Red Rocks show there and all that stuff. And he's a very prominent um, promoter. Anyway, um, Barry called me up, said that he heard some tapes from uh, Bruce Glattman that was in L.A. And would I like to take a shot at the big time? So I said, uh, sure. You know, so I did that. So I, I said, I have to give this band a notice. I gave him a notice. I went to Colorado. Um, <clears throat> I met with him. Uh, about a couple of days later, he asked me if I wanted to do a showcase for CDS Records. And I said, uh, yeah, okay. So, you know, I had to write, I wrote like seven songs within a week's time. I assembled a whole band in Colorado, rehearsed them. CBS came on a really snowy night. Um, they saw me play. They left about three, de- three days later. Uh, I was asked to go to Los Angeles and have a meeting with all the head honchos at uh, CBS. Uh, I went to Century City, had the meeting. Um, they asked me if I'd be interested in playing with this band called Journey. Uh, had I ever heard of them? And I said, well, my I never heard their music, except that I know that they do like 15 minute, you know, instrumental songs and stuff like that. And, um, and my brother knew all about him and, and uh, I, you know, I didn't know much about him, but so I flew up to, uh, San Francisco and, um, Herbie Herbert, their manager picked me up and we drove me to SIR studios. And, um, I, you know, we talked for a while and then we got up on stage and we just started jamming and, uh, I, it was some really great chemistry. We, played for like three hours and just jamming and there was some pretty incredible stuff. And I wish that we had that recorded. <laughs> and, um, and then, uh, just everything started falling, um, together. And then I wrote, um, I think the first thing I wrote was, uh, um, I think we did, I think we wrote anytime, um, uh, Greg Raleigh and I wrote anytime at his house. And then we, took it into the rehearsal and worked that out. And then, uh, later on, um, wrote uh, wheel in the sky and then wrote, uh, winds of March and then wrote another one called, uh, all for you. And then, uh, wrote another one called diva and all that. And, um, and then I think some, another one, I can't remember just her way. So, um, you know, we were rehearsing and we went out and toured. Uh, we we played in ha- uh, Hawaii, did uh, Diamond Head uh, Festival there right. for two days, which was really beautiful. And there's footage of us playing there, which the sound on that footage, uh, I believe, is from the monitors. It's not from any other, re- you know, like from the board or anything like right, that. Right. So somebody had a camera, was you know, on the side of the stage and their camera picked up the... Uh, the side monitors. So that's, you know, pretty much it on that one. But, um, and then we toured throughout the United States. Um, we did a show, our first show we did in, um, we did this, uh, Texas tour and, um, we opened up for, um, uh, Ario Speedwagon and Judas Priest when, um, they were just starting out, which was pretty interesting. There's a bill for you. Oh yeah. It was an odd bill. I'd say. Uh, and then we uh, later on we caught up with um, uh, on the Emerson Lake and Palmer tour, and we did Canada also. We did our Ontario, and no, uh, I can't remember where else we went in in um, hopefully, uh, Vancouver. Ho- hopefully I Montreal. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember. I I think we did. You know, I think Emerson Lake and Palmer wouldn't not hit Montreal, yeah. but it was so long ago. <laughs> 
Now, uh, your hope I didn't bore you. <laughs> no, 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 no. The the duration was was very short with, with Journey, and and there's been all kinds of different stories over the years about why right. you left. Um, what do you think was was the the main reason? Was it simply that management couldn't agree to a contract with you? Well, I I was managed by Barry Fay. Right. And then I got into Journey, and um, Herbie uh, wanted me. He wanted me to. Um, uh, he, he wanted me to, to to drop Barry. Right. And uh, fire him, and um, and I just couldn't do it. And I just said, "Well, can you guys work out some sort of numbers or whatever?" You know, because um, Herbie wanted twenty five percent of me, and. Uh, Barry already had 20% of me. And so, you know, not too much left for me. <laughs> and, um, and so that was kind of ping ponging around, but at the same time, there was this guy, uh, an A&R a &R guy that was, um, funding, um, Steve Perry's, um, demos, you know, paying for a studio time. And, um, he was, he was, uh, sort of hounding, uh, Herbie about, um, you know, this guy, Steve Perry, and um, said that, you know, if you got Steve Perry in the band, I'll give you a bigger budget for the next album. We'll get you more, more, um, we'll get your radio play. We'll give you more tour support. So it basically, basically became one of those, uh, I'll give you an offer you can't refuse, you know, Godfather style. Right. So that's what kind of really happened. And, um, you know, it's just, um, you know, that's what happened. So I, I think the band would have made it either way. It was just the right time. It was the right, you know, formula. It was just the right climate. Like, I, you know, it was just the right time. So I, I don't think, um, you know, if I had been in the band, it wouldn't have been just as successful. It would have been a different type of band. It would have been a lot more edgier. And um, then it um, became... But I'm very proud of what I did right. uh, with the band, and I'll never forget, you know, the very first time I heard Wheel in the Sky on the radio. So, you know, to me, even though I wasn't in the band, I heard it on the radio, and I was just like, um, you know, it was a very emotional thing for me. It was like somebody being an author and finally getting, you know, walking by the bookstore and see their, their book plastered on the front, you know, on the front window. So yeah, it felt validated. <laughs> As a writer, what was your reaction to hearing somebody else's voice, though, on essentially your song? Um. Well, I. It didn't bother me. It just uh, I I was kind of flattered because he pretty much emulated, you know, what I had done or what I had had done. Um, there's demos around with me singing "Wheel in the Sky," and it's a demo. And I didn't really, you know, it was like the first or two takes, but I didn't get a time to look at it and go, you know, I shouldn't have sang it so hard here. I should, you know, smooth it out here or the dynamics, is, it comes in too hard right here. And, and I would have smoothed it out and, you know, I would have sculpted it. I, I would have produced it, the vocals, um, which I didn't get a chance to do. So it is what it is. Right. Now, you remained friends with the band. I mean, uh, you leaving the band wasn't a, a clash with, with the guys. In fact, on your uh, no. Perfect Stranger album of 1979, uh, you have Neil and uh, Greg on it. Or, right. Which, you know, which is exciting. Um, yeah. Uh, let, let me talk to you quickly about that album. Uh, Jimmy Iovine is on there, who, who became a huge, huge uh, player in the industry. You've got Jimmy yeah. Jimmy Crespo, who wasn't in Aerosmith at that time, but about two or three years later joined. Will Lee, who who went on in the David Letterman band, John McVie of Fleetwood Mac. I mean, that's a powerhouse little album you had. Um, how did that all come together? Well, after um, um, after I left Journey. Um, my lawyer um, got me a deal with um, Arista Records. So uh, about three months later, and I went to New York and I met with, uh, with um, well, actually, 
I was rehearsing in Los Angeles and uh, Clive Davis came and, um, you know, sat around for a while while I was rehearsing and stuff. And he kind of gave me the, uh, the nod and uh, the next thing you know, I was in New York. So I sort of was like all I discovered by Clive Davis also, which is a big, big honor, you know, big feather because he's quite the... Uh, Impresario. He's quite the record executive. He's, yeah. you know, he's he's in a league of his own, you know. He, he, the funny thing about it is you go to his office, you know, and he's sitting there at this desk and you're sitting there in front of him and then behind him he has these big sort of like four foot by four foot posters of like Sly Stone. He's sitting there with Sly Stone or he's sitting there with, you know, Janis Joplin or he's sitting there with Simon and Garfunkel or he's sitting there, you know, there's just these pictures behind him. It's just so funny. It's like you're walking into God's room, you know. Yeah, and, and and you know, I don't know if Jimmy's on the same level of Clive. I would argue that they no. are. <laughs> nah, but but you know, Jimmy's done pretty good too, right? So Jimmy has done unbelievable, unbelievable. He's done. We're both born on the same day. It was kind of funny. It's like his mom was being, you know, having him on the East Coast, and my mom was having me on the West Coast. Uh, back in March of, uh, was it both? March 11th. March yeah, 11th. we're both March 11th kids. Both of, both of 53? No. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was, yeah. You know, I'm an oldie now. You know, I can go, I can park in uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in the senior parking lot. Uh, I can ask for a senior uh, ticket now to the movies. You, you can get uh, a senior discount at uh, IHOP. There you go. Um, right, right. So, so let's talk pre- about, about pre-chewed meal. <laughs> let, let's talk about this Vinnie Vincent invasion. Now, I was in fact just doing an interview with Frankie Benelli of Quiet Riot, and uh-huh. he was talking to me about, uh, and I didn't expect this, that Vinnie would go over to his apartment and they would they would jam on songs and stuff. Um, I'll just start there. Were you part of any of that, where 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 Frankie and and Vinnie were getting together and and working on songs, or or was that pre you getting involved with Vinny? I guess that must have been pre. Yeah. But do you know that um, when I did the uh, Perfect Stranger album and I, I toured, Frankie Benelli was my drummer. Was he really? Yeah. I, I kind of gave Frankie his, his big break. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, that's... And, and Frankie and I are very good friends. Um, this year, I've seen Frankie and, and uh, Chuck uh, from uh, Quiet Riot. Chuck I think Wright. I've seen him this year. Yeah, Chuck Wright. Uh, I've seen them like six times this summer uh, play around uh, Illinois and all that. So he and I go back a long time. We're very, very close. Oh, that's great. Uh, uh, we, we, talk, we talk all the time. Oh, that, that's great. Fra- Frankie's great. In fact... Um, I love him. He's uh, the best. And this has nothing to do with the interview, but when my daughter was born in 2003, uh, Frankie sent a nice sweater along for her and, and a that's car. That's him. And that's Frankie. That's, that's, that's his style. Um, so, yeah, he's a, he's a love. Oh, absolutely. A- absolutely great guy. So, which is great because you've got this um, Vinnie Vincent connection that, that I want to get to here. <laughs> um, uh, and by the way, I didn't know that Frankie had played with you on the Perfect Strangers tour, which is which is kind of cool to, to yeah, know. Yeah, actually, actually, we were we were playing um, in Chicago, and we were opening up for Van Halen. We did a whole, we did like I can't remember how many dates, but we did a couple of weeks of opening up for Van Halen, um, running with the Devil tour. But anyway, we're in Chicago, and we're playing, and all of a sudden, this somebody well actually. This is what um, um, Frankie told me. He said, I was up, you know, I was behind there playing the drums and I saw this guy in the crowd and he had this bottle in his hand and he kept moving around and he kept, and I said, I kept watching and watching him. And then finally he threw the bottle through like a Heineken bottle, I think. And, um, and I saw the bottle coming at me. I'm talking about me. I saw the bottle coming and I, and I just moved to the side and a bottle just flew by my head and it hit Frankie right in the head. And Frankie said, 
yeah, man, I just, I felt this bam. I go, what the heck? Did I hit myself with my sticks? You know, and all of a sudden he's like hitting the snare and he says, I start seeing blood, you know, splatting all around. I go, what? I mean, I, I thought it was the red lights, you know, I was sweating and, and he goes, you know, it was like, fuck you. So we just, I, I, I turned around and I saw him and I just stopped the whole band. And I, I told the, uh, the guys with all the lights, I said, put it down in the crowd and point. And I pointed out who it was. And I had the, I told the whole crowd to step away from that guy, you know, and the next thing you know, the bouncers came, they grabbed that guy and they just took him behind stage and kicked his butt out the door. You know, that, that's what happened. It was quite the story. That's funny. And, and that's so 1979-ish. Because, you know, I started going to shows in, in 79 and, and all through the 80s. And that would happen. In fact, there, there was one show that I was at where somebody had uh, thrown something on stage and the bouncers took that person and accidentally, as they were leading him to the police car, uh, whoops, he fell down the stairs. And then when he got to the police car, whoops, his leg happened to not get into the door before they slammed it. And, uh, <laughs> you know, you can't do that anymore. Now, now you get sued and, and prosecuted oh, yeah. and, and thrown in jail. But, the, the, that, that was rock back then. So, so uh, this wasn't part of, of, of the, uh, show notes that I had put together, but how was it, uh, touring with Van Halen? I mean, 1979 running with the devil, the band was, was basically on fire. How was that for yeah. you? I, I know the, you know, opening bands don't always go out and see the main bands and vice versa, but you, you must have. You must have gone out once or twice and had a look. And, then and, and had a had a look had a at Van, had a look at Van Halen. You must you must have gone out to the front of the house. Oh and, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we I would play, and then um, you know, halfway through the set, um, I would see Eddie and uh, Michael and Alex, sit, you know, stand on the side there and watch me do like a couple of songs, and then they would go in their dressing room to get ready for their show, and and then I'd be done and. And then I'd go back to my dressing room and I'd, you know, run into them. And I mean, it was really weird because I, I don't know what was going on with um, David. David. Yeah. I, I David never spoke to me at, during the uh, show. So uh, during any of the shows or, or during the whole tour, he just was not very nice. So right. um, to put it mildly. <laughs> and um, so... But it was really weird because, uh, you know, I'd be talking to Eddie and Michael and stuff like that. And they said, oh, yeah, we got your album. We listened to it on the bus and everything like this. And and um, then Eddie goes, I wish we had you as our singer. I'm going like, what? And he said it to me like three times. And I, I just was kind of, I never like, you know, I never go, well, OK, well, let's do it, you know. Um, so it was it was funny. I, did, I guess the, the climate was still, it was getting thick. <laughs> at the time there, even that early stage with um, David. But it was great. It was a great experience. You know, they were, they were amazing. I mean, he's, David Lee Roth is quite the showman. You know, to me, that's what he is. He's a showman. I don't really consider him that, that you know, great vocalist or whatever, but, you know, J Jagger's not a great vocalist, but he's a great character and he's like, writes the most amazing lyrics, but, you know, David's not in that category. Yeah, but, but, but uh, you know, I've I've always said this, especially to to young and upcoming musicians. It's not always about the talent. Uh, it's nice that you can play eighty seven notes in 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 half a second. But uh, you look at Madonna, you look at Kiss, you look at David Lee Roth, uh, CC Deville, or or the band Poison and stuff. Uh, not technically proficient. But they put on a great yeah. show. They put on a great yeah, show. Yeah, they're like they're like cat and they're like cartoon characters, you know. Yeah, and and that's the way that that's sort of what you got to learn is is that it's more than just talent. It's about a whole package about visual and and anyway. Um, speaking of visual, let's let's get back to Vinnie Vincent because the the visuals on on that band were were, were certainly <laughs> were certainly something. Um, how do you uh, hook up? with Vinnie Vincent, where does that come from? He, he's out of Kiss, he, he's looking for a deal, and how does Robert the singer end up in that camp? Um, the, I, I, who, oh, what's his name? Adam, a guy that played, the guy, um, Adam, who uh, wrote songs with uh, Paul Stanley, 
Adam Mitchell. Adam Mitchell. Yeah, Adam Mitchell. Okay. I, which I've interviewed. He he's great. I mean, he's a, an absolute talented, talented songwriter. Great guy. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Adam was friends with a drummer friend of mine, um, and he he said that. Um, well, he was a friend of, and that's how I met Adam. And then I guess Adam was writing with Paul, and I guess Vinny was somewhere around in the, somewhere around, and and somehow he asked Adam if he knew anyone that sang, a lead singer. So Adam gave Vinny Vincent my uh, my number. And I'm sure you thanked him for that many times. <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let me give you a knucklehead sandwich. You know? <laughs> right, uh, but uh, but so... yeah, I, I I never I never I haven't seen Adam in millennium. So, but uh, if he hears this, thanks a lot. Thanks for the headache. <laughs> thanks for the headache. Yeah. So, so so talk to me a a little bit about this Vinnie Vincent thing. Um, you know. Musically, for me as a fan of of the genre, I, I thought there was a lot of a lot of busy work going on in the songs, and not a lot, not a lot of room for them to breathe. Just there was just sort of too much guitar. Um, it was all on eleven, right? <laughs> and it was all going. It, sort of, you know, it started on eleven and it ended on eleven. You know. So so when Adam introduced you to uh, to Vinny, and you get into the studio and you hear these tracks, how much? Robert got to go in each track. How much writing did you get to do, or was it pretty much, "Hey, listen, this is it. Just sing, be happy," and yes. what was the process? Um, well, Vinny came to my house. He called me up. We had a chat on the phone, and um, I told him to come to my house. And he uh, knocked on the door, and I opened up the door, and there's Vinny with a t-shirt on, and sneakers, and jeans, and and sort of, you know, his hair a little long and, you know, just a normal kind of situation of uh, his, his appearance and came in the house and I, I threw on the this cassette that he had and I think he had Boys Are Gonna Rock on there and Substitute and, and um, some other songs. And I thought, God, these are really good. And, and, and I think he, he was singing on them. And I, which I thought he's, you know, he sang great. He, I thought he should have done the whole thing himself, basically. But he wanted to have a band and, you know, the whole, the whole thing of a band, you know, the whole thing. So, um, I, uh, so we started, he came over again and I had a Porta studio, like a little four track thing. And we started doing demos and, um, then later on, he wanted to go in the studio, and he 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 took those tracks that he played for me, and um, he had those tracks on twenty four track, and um, he wanted me to sing over them. So um, we actually went into this studio called Sandcastle Studios in Hollywood, and engineering for us was um, Andy Johns, which is Glenn Johns's brother. Andy did. Um, um, Led Zeppelin. He worked with the yeah. He worked with Zeppelin. He did uh, Exile with the Stones. Andy is like you know amazing. He's worked with everybody. He's yeah, absolutely. Ultra famous. And unfortunately, and, um, unfortunately, so like he passed said, away. Yeah, I know. He was just he was great to to work with, and what stories he had to tell, and he was just a great guy. He was a ball of fun, and. Um, uh, we uh, we we went in and um, and recorded these songs and then uh, Andy and Andy mixed them and then um, I guess uh, that was oh, that was after the kiss thing I think yeah yep, that's absolutely. what happened so yeah this was after the so what I guess what happened is I'm trying to get my time frame here. So anyway, we did some demos um, um, prior to the thing with Andy, and then he said, "You know, I got this call from uh, Kiss, and they want me to they want me to join the band, and um, you know, I can't do this this project anymore." And I said, "Vinny," he said, "Don't worry about it. Go do the Kiss thing. You know, you got you're living in a small apartment. You got two 
two, tw- you got twins coming, you know, get yourself some money, set yourself up, get yourself in a, you know, a normal situation. And so, um, he did. So he, he did his kiss run and, um, then, uh, you know, I guess I don't know how many months he was with him, but after that he called me up and then that's when we, uh, we met up again and um, and did the demos and stuff like that. So with Andy Johns and then those demos, um, then he went to Chrysalis and uh, he got his deal. And um, but in the the beginning of the deal between us was that it was going to be a like a band fifty fifty kind of thing with he and I. But he decided to grab the whole bowl of cherries, you know. Which uh, a lot of people do, and there's there's tons of money on the on, on the table. Um, boy, there's so much to, so much to ask here. Let, let me go with, with this, and the, I'll I'll go forward, and then we'll come back again. Uh, there was an unreleased album, which has been called a whole bunch of different things: Guitars from Hell, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, uh, that includes Andre Labelle, who also is in the sky now. Um, right. Uh, tell me about. How does how do you have a second album full of or a full second album? You you were you were gone before the first one was released with Mark Slaughter even lip syncing your vocals on, on videos. Um, had you just made sort of twenty songs the first time out and kept ten for now and ten for later? How, how does the Guitars from Hell unreleased album come to be? Um, good question. Um, was it recorded after or all at the same time? No, that was all recorded after the whole, um, invasion, uh, thing exploded. And so and you came so, back to so the Vinny wrote, uh, Vinny wrote everything. Um, the only thing I wrote with Vinny was, um, do you want to make love and invasion? I wrote those two with him. And back on the streets, no? No, uh, no, no, I no, didn't no, 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 that was, that was, he, uh, he and I sing that, we do like a duo thing on right, that, right, right, that was, but, that was uh, Invasion and, um, Do You Want to Make Love, I wrote the lyrics for those, right, 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 and we wrote that together. Right, and, and, and my brain uh, uh, misled me, it's, uh, Robert Free, uh, sorry, Richard Freeman, right, who, who did Boys Gonna, uh, no, Back on the Street, there you go. Oh. Yeah, I got it correct. Okay. But but it's the uh, it's the RF initials and the man at the end that, that sadly confused my brain. But all right, um, so so you did this this second album. Um, when was it recorded? Well, I don't know when when did um, the invasion thing kind of end with Vinny. Uh, when did it end in terms of the band itself? Y- yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see the second. 80, 85. Well, this, this, his second album came out in 88. So it must have all, oh. it, all systems go came out in 88. So it must have imploded oh. around 88, 89, 90, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Around there. Yeah. So I guess Vinny wrote all this new stuff and he approached me again and, um, you know, kind of, you, I felt bad for him. And so I said, sure, I'll go into it, you know, and um, <laughs> I put my foot in the bear trap once again, you know. Yeah, the, the, and, there was no feeling of once bitten, twice shy? Um, yes, there was, but, you know, I I was a nice guy. What can I say? I was I was just a, being a nice guy. And I felt I felt I felt sorry for him in a sense. And I. You know, I knew that he had his family and all that stuff. So I just went along with it, you know. And then it got screwy as always. You know, he's constantly, you know, shooting himself in the foot. But um, I, I did the I did those with him. Uh, we went in and and I I'd, I'd sing them, and then he goes, "Oh, let's do another one. Let's do another." And and I just go, "No, no, let's let me finish that one. You know, I, I let me get it." balance you know like maybe the first verse is really good and the second verse is kind of screwy it doesn't you know go along with the first the melody of the first verse let me correct that you know he goes oh we'll get to that we'll get to that so he just had me blow over a lot of shit you know so and then he released it you know which i was kind of disturbed because i didn't get a chance to really you know put it into focus you know it's like doing a sketch and then he puts it out as a painting 
you know? Right. So, with um, scratch vocals. I, uh, huh? With scratch vocals all over it. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I thought that was, you know, not cool. But, um, you know, he, he, I don't know what his situation at the time was, but he just put it out. And then I guess, um, well, he had sold a bunch of them, like for some outrageous amount of money for these cassette box or whatever. And, um, he didn't deliver. And then, um, Surprise. Then I got all these like emails and I got people trying to get a hold of me, asking me if I knew anything about this and where's my where's my C D box set and where's my this and that and do you know Vinny and where I can get a hold of them? And it's like I was just bombarded with all these people, you know, because of um what he did. The joy the joy that is Vinny. Um let's see, do I do Bobby Rock, the drummer uh, last yeah. week put out a um, blog post where he talked about the rehearsals for how he got the drums, where he drove in from Texas overnight, borrowed money from his parents and came, right. in, came in with Vinny, Dana and you uh, sitting there and, and saying, play this, play that. And it went on for forever and ever. Uh, do you have any recollections of, of that drum audition? Was it this? Oh moment? yeah. I, as if it were yesterday. And uh, what are what are well basically what are some of your memories of that audition time? Well, I know that I know that he just he just barely made it into the uh, parking lot, like rolled into the parking lot because he didn't have his gas. He didn't have any gas. He was down to fumes, and um, he just hopped out of there, started setting up his drums. Uh, while he was setting up his drums and just kind of puttering around, I thought this guy's really good. And um, and then he set, he got everything ready, and he just said, "I'm ready." And um, so then he just said, "You know, play a couple of this beats and this and this and that." And he was playing, and and I asked him to play a couple of things, and and I thought he was just amazing. Um, he was ambidextrous. I mean, he was just, he was all over those drums and he was just such a nice person, you know? And, um, so after the audition, there were some more drummers and stuff like that. And I just, I just said to, um, Bobby, I just said, Bobby, just hang, this is going to be really fast. I said, I said, I, you know, you're the guy for me. I, I think you're the guy. I know you are. And so he just hung and, um, and the rest is history, you know, yeah. but I, I think I had a lot. I mean, I told Vinny, I go, this is the guy. He goes, Oh yeah. Yeah. I go, yeah, this is the guy, you know, you're not going to find anybody else like this, you know? And, um, he agreed. So Bobby got in the band and he's just this great person. I mean, I read that uh, story you told him and he's a good writer too. Great writer. Yeah. He, he he did a good job writing that. Yeah, he, he, yeah, absolutely. He did a, a great job writing that. Um, yeah, and, when, and you know, you know, he had a very tragic situation with his girlfriend. Um, that I don't know that, about. Yeah, I mean, this is a sad, sad story. His girlfriend was on Ventura Boulevard, went to an ATM, and was robbed and was stabbed. Oh my. Yeah, and she was pregnant. They had they were, they were going to have a baby. And what was she? She stabbed and okay, or stabbed and and murdered? Died. Oh God! Oh God! Did not yeah. did not know that. Um, oh, it was on the news and everything in uh, in Los Angeles. And this is, of course, back in eighty five, eighty six. You're talking about. Uh, I don't. I don't. I don't know when that happened. Oh, okay. I think that was that, that was later on, um, maybe in the late eighties or early nineties. Oh. But um, you know, I he came over to my house about three or three or four months later. You know, and I, whenever he was in my area, he would just drop by and, and we'd chat. But uh, I've always kept close with him, and I just saw him recently uh, playing with Rita. You know, Rita yeah. Ford. Rita Ford, yeah. And, uh, I just saw that yeah, too at, at Heavy Montreal in August, and it, it was great. The band sounded fantastic. Oh uh, yeah, he's he's a monster. He gets to do great solo and everything, and you know. But um, he is, um, 
he's a great person and, and I'll always, always adore him. He's just a great guy. Um, and the, and the rest of the band, they can all go jump in the blender. <laughs> including Dana? Oh, especially Dana. I don't care for him. Okay. Cause uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be upfront. Dana has always been exceptionally, exceptionally nice to me. Has always, you know, whenever a band he's involved with come into town, he'll put me on the guest list. He'll, he'll, uh, always been very nice to my kids, so on and so forth. Um, uh, I'll, I'll I'll talk to you off the phone if you want. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, um, but uh, I will ask you this though. On on record though, Dana though back in that time was more of a, uh, you, you know, uh, what was the word for it? He was the wet, he was he had his hands on the steering wheel. Vinny basically just handed his life over to Dana. And Dana sort of steered his his uh, boat, you know. Right, and and Dana was involved in uh, recruiting personnel for Ozzy Osbourne's band. He well, that's the rumor. Right, um, but he certainly was more than just the bass player in a sort of glam eighties band. He he was more of a business behind the scenes kind of. Yeah, band. he you know he I think. You know, Dana really pictured himself as a sort of like an entrepreneur of uh, rock and roll, which is great. You know, and he's uh, probably very, very, very successful in it. And, um, you know, then that's great. Yeah. But uh, I that's as far as I go. All right. Um, you know, we had said that we would do 20 to 30 minutes. We're at 45. Uh, I'll just ask you a couple. <laughs> uh, I'll ask you a couple more before we... we, we Don't worry up. about it. You can edit it and do whatever you want. Absolutely. Um, the the video for Boys, Gonna, Boys Are Gonna Rock, which right. is, is sort of the one Vinny song that I like. I'll be, I'll, I'll be up front on the fact that I don't like the Vinnie Vincent albums. I don't like... Vinnie Vincent as a guitarist. I thought he was terrible for Kiss, and, and I apologize for those that that's going to insult. And I apologize to you for saying that I don't like an album that you sing. No, on. no big deal. I, I got to say, I, I love the other stuff you've done. The Sky and Journey, I'm in, but, but um, and I apologize for saying that. But yeah. the, vi the video comes out, uh, you're no longer in the band because contractually, it, it you know, Vinnie wanted all the cherries, the bowl of cherries, as you said, and didn't want to give you anything. And, and you see... Uh, basically, Mark Slaughter uh, lip syncing to your vocals. Was that a strange moment for you? <laughs> yeah, I'd say it was pretty strange. Yeah. Um, well, you know, it all started when um, Vinny, uh, Vinny had this guy, uh, a manager, George Suet. Oh, George Suet. Yes, yes. He also managed Peter Chris and Ace Fraley on the Kiss reunion tour. And according to rumors, uh, was one of the reasons why the lineup didn't last longer uh, than the right. uh, three or four years they were together. Right. He was uh, a box of spiders, to put it mildly. Um, he, we were going... We, <laughs> we were at the, the photo shoot for the album, you know? And, um, so I just, which was, uh, it was horrendous. I was, uh, I had, my hair was like at one length. Uh, the, the, the photographer goes, Oh, give him a, you know, to a stylist, give him a little haircut, you know, cut my hair like a fucking poodle. And, um, and the next thing I know, I'm like, taking pictures, you know, with this thing. And I look like I'm with like uh, three inflatable drag queens. And, um, it's just, uh, you know, hideous, um, album cover and all that. And, um, and I didn't fit in obviously. Um, and so on the side that, you know, that's going on. And on the side, George is like saying that he, you have to sign this contract and he hands me this phone book. And it's like, you know, sign it. And I go, no, I'm not going to sign this thing. I'm going to have to have a lawyer look at it. He goes, no, trust me, trust me, sign it, just sign it. And I said, George, I'm not going to sign it. So he, I found out later that he was really desperate for me to sign it. And because he had told Chrysalis that he had signed me up to the band and all that. And then Chrysalis found out that he was 
um, that he was lying to him, and then they got rid of him, and and, and then after that, um, um, Chrysalis approached me and said, um, you know, we would we'd like to sign you up, and so you'd be with Chrysalis. And but they weren't going to give me any money, but I would be contractually obligated to them. And I said, you know, I'm not going to, I don't want to do this, this. And so they said, well, we're going to take your, um, we're going to take your voice off the album. And I said, well, you do what you have to do. And I don't think you're going to do that because you're going to have to go in and remix this whole thing and spend so much more money on this, on this project than you already have. And it's going to be another nightmare situation. And so you just go ahead, do whatever you want. And so, um, you know, we kind of got in a big battle and I had a lawyer and um, we ended up, I ended up suing Chrysalis and I ended up winning. And then while all this is going on, I'm getting phone calls saying, hey, Vinnie Vincent's um, video is going to be on MTV. Are you going to watch it? And I'm going like, oh, yeah, sure, definitely. And so, you know, time came, turn on the TV, you know, here's the new Vinnie Vincent uh, single, and it's Boys Are Gonna Rock, and boom, out, out it comes. And all of a sudden, you know, here's this guy singing, lip syncing to my voice. And I'm just like, I just like slap jaw, just go, I can't believe this. This was like so weird. And, um, and then I get bombarded with phone calls and all that stuff. So it was a strange thing. You know, I, I, I thought, what's this guy? It looked like he was wearing panties outside of his, um, his leather pants or something like that. And he's, you know, singing along what his name is, uh, Mark Slaughter. And, um, and I'm just like, Oh God. But, you know, years and years and years go by and, you know, I've ragged on, on, uh, Mark Slaughter a bit, but I read an interview with him and, uh, or, 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 yeah, I read it. No, I, I heard an interview with him and I think he's a very nice guy. I think he's a really hard worker. Um, he's, you know, still out there plugging away and, um, you know, God bless him. You know? Yeah. And so I, um. So I, my, my, I never knew anything or never heard him speak or talk or, you know, like I said, and I, and I came out, uh, like liking him and, uh, I, I respect him, you know, he, he was a kid at that time. That was his big break and he took it, you know, and he took it, he took it to the wall, you know? Yeah, and and I'll uh, I'll be upfront in saying that I've known Mark for, for many years and I think he's, he's ex- exceptionally nice. I mean, he's a, he's a great talent. And when my, uh, wife's father passed away in 2013 i put together a kiss tribute album to uh, benefit a palliative care home called a world with heroes and mark donated a guitar track on on a song for a a song called unholy so uh very 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 always been very nice to me now we're, we're, we're we're reaching the hour mark so i'm gonna i'm gonna end with this another person that i find to be exceptionally nice is kelly hansen of foreigner these days used to be in hurricane he produced your 2002 world in your eyes album um any uh, any words about kelly um well that was uh yeah i did that record for frontiers records right and um i <laughs> Um, I was doing that record and then uh, Frontiers kind of pulled the plug on me because they said it wasn't sounding journey enough and um, it was sounding too contemporary or whatever. So um, this guy that was sort of babysitting me in a sense and and overseeing for Frontiers. um, Mario or no, Serafino. Yeah, Serafino. Yeah, they they uh, they got they took my tracks and all the recordings that I was working on, and they kind of snuck them out of the studio where I was working and uh, gave them to Kelly, and then Kelly went in and did like background vocals and and stuff like that, and and uh, he he mixed it. 
So I basically, in the middle of the, you know, ha- of this project, um, just kind of walked away from it. Um, it was really a nightmare working with um, Frontiers Records. Um, but not working with Kelly. Know. I mean, obviously, he, he didn't do anything on purpose. No, he only did what he was supposed, you know, right, he, right. he only did what he was told to do. And, you know, unfortunately, it wasn't, you know, exactly. <laughs> it's like, I wouldn't want them to go out and pick up a pair of black socks for me, basically. Because <laughs> it's not what I wanted the record to sound like or to be like. Okay. And, um, so you never actually so met I, Kelly. I just kind of, I just kind of, you know, threw it to the wayside. But a lot of people seem to like that record. Um, I, I don't see anything val- valuable of the record at all. I mean, there's maybe one or two tracks that I like. Um, there's a, a track called um, Room for One, which I did like. Um, that was I wrote that with uh, Rusty Anderson, who's the guitar player for um, Paul McCartney. Right, that's not a bad. That's not a bad gig. But so, so you never actually got to be in the studio with Kelly. Or work with Kelly. Um, I did go in the studio with Kelly at his home studio, uh, like a, for a couple of days to patch up a few things. But basically, I just went in to patch them up, and I knew that I had no control over it, and and um, just you know drove home. Right. And uh, whatever, however it happened, uh, and happened, you know. There you go. So it wasn't. It was. It wasn't. Um, it wasn't my cup of tea. Well, uh, I will say a lot of people did, like you said, did did enjoy that album, and and it came out uh, years and years ago. Um, yeah. Robert, a great, great pleasure. We should definitely do a, a part two at some point, especially when the new uh, Sky album comes out. And uh, thanks. Did, Sky- have you ever uh, heard the Sky albums? I've heard them only via YouTube. I have to say. I, I, I checked oh, I out. I checked out all the videos, and I, I was on the the Sky Online uh, site, and I and I listened to that stuff. But I, I definitely need to to pick those up. Uh, yeah, I think you have uh, Spotify. I do. We're on Spotify. There you go. So I will. Uh, that that yeah, is going to be. Yeah, just type in uh, the Sky Majestic, and you'll find it easy that way. The uh, right, right, which was the uh, 2014 album i believe right it's the yeah the second album yeah. yeah the first album is much more um kind of rock and garage kind of live feel to it which is um you know good at that time but then majestic i wanted to do a little bit more production and uh and and satisfier it's going to be a little bit more um more spacey kind of feel to it Right, and so we'll, we'll we'll remind folks to head over to the skyofficial dot com. Uh, I did want to talk right. to you also about all the uh, TV production work, but uh, I think this is an exhaustive interview at this point. <laughs> um, so uh, let me say let me say goodbye and 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 hang on for a second. Okay. So, thank well, you thank you, Mitch. Absolutely. Thank you for your interest and uh, your support, and really appreciate it. Absolutely, Thanks. anytime. Much. Thank you. And there you have it, folks. My interview with. Robert Fleischman, singer for the Vinnie Vincent Invasion back in the day, and of course, Journey Wheels in the Sky. Uh, you gotta love that song. And before that, up front, we had Rob Halford of Judas Priest. Uh, in fact, let me just say that again because uh, it's Rob Halford of Judas Priest. We had Rob Halford of Judas Priest. Uh, wow, That's, you don't get better than that. That That is as exciting as it gets uh, for me. If you enjoy what you are hearing on this podcast, please head over to iTunes and leave a positive review. If you haven't done so already, uh, sign up for the podcast at iTunes, Spreaker, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and uh, you know have it delivered to you regularly so you can enjoy all the great interview uh, that I uh, managed to get. Uh, of course, uh, this one, Rob Halford. I'll just keep saying that. Rob Halford, Rob Halford, Rob Halford, the metal voice. You gotta love Rob Halford. And of course, thank you to Robert Fleischman for being a part of the show as well. And as always, um, bye for now. <laughs>